My name is Wendy Potomsky and I'm the managing partner and owner of Retake Furniture Rentals. Retake is once again a proud supporter of the Canadian Film Festival and is working to contribute to the Canadian film and TV industry by making it an easy and sustainable place to do business. Retake provides sustainable short and long-term furniture rental options to meet production schedules and product needs. Retake also understands the importance of set design and the dynamic nature of the film and TV industry, which is why we created a company to specifically support Canadian filmmakers. Retake can assist you in setting up your production office with sustainable alternatives to keep your team working safely as we all head back to work. We use sustainable approaches to minimize product going to landfill, which means any product supplied by Retake is helping to support the circular economy. Our in-house upholstery services can tailor our product to meet your set design requirements and match your color schemes. Contact us to discuss your office furniture needs. Our goal is to help you get back to work as safely and efficiently as possible. Stay safe everyone and enjoy the films and shorts at this year's Canadian Film Festival. Celebrate Canadian filmmakers on Super Channel Fuse with an exclusive homegrown event. I'm ready. Go. The Canadian Film Fest presented by Super Channel brings this year's festival into your home for a second year as a virtual experience. Goodbye. Every Thursday, Friday and Saturday night until April 18th. Enjoy the premieres of indie films and shorts from critically acclaimed and up and coming Canadian producers and directors. And this is where the donkey starts talking. Cut. Immerse yourself in this inspiring and spirited event both on air and online with live Facebook Q&A sessions that follow the films. Makes sense. Start it. Experience the Canadian Film Fest proudly presented by Super Channel. Okay. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, I have my mimosas. We are, uh, and hi, everyone who's watching us talk. I guess we're, <laughs> we're having our conversation. We're chilling. We're having drinks that look like mimosas or whatever. Um, we're going to go fast because our, oh, nice, because our friend Mina has to hop on a ferry. So um, hi, everybody that's chilling and watching us. And um, Ilan, Mina, what, let's introduce ourselves to each other and to everyone, even though we know who each other is. Um, who are you, Mina? <laughs> oh, um, writer, director, um, beggar, financer, producer, trying to get, um, tr trying to change the landscape of what we see here in Canadian film. And good at it. Sorry. Hi, Ilan. <laughs> Ilan. Uh, yeah, Elan Mastai. Uh, I'm uh, mostly a writer. Uh, I'm, I'm currently a, a writer and a, a supervising producer on the show This Is Us, uh, uh, which is on NBC and Hulu and CTV. Uh, I also uh, write features. Um, uh, wrote a movie called The F Word, as it's known in Canada. Um, Mike Dowse directed a couple years ago with Dan Radcliffe and Adam Driver and Zoe Kazan. I also write novels. Uh, I wrote a book called All Are Wrong Today's. Um, uh, which was out a couple years ago, which I'm uh, currently in the process of developing as a, as a TV series. Amazing. Awesome. Hey. And Corey? Oh, I'm Tell Corey Bowles. a little bit about you. <laughs> I'm Corey Bowles. I'm a, I guess I'm a multidisciplinary. I, I am a, these days I've been directing a lot of TV and direct features, but I'm writing TV as well. And I wrote my feature and I'm an actor, one time actor on, on TV and all those other things that, that go in between make music, choreography and stuff. So yeah. Um, awesome. I'm all, I'm all excited. Cause I, you know, I, I've been dying cause I, I want to hold off any, this is us questions. Cause I, oh, I just want to be like, listen, man, let, let's, can we just talk about things? <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't. But I'm going uh, to reveal a series of gigantic uh, twists that nobody knows are coming, but I'm going to seed them into the regular conversation, like the clues. So, so you won't even know they're in there. And then when the show airs, you're like, oh, my God, you told me that. But I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> you, you know what? This uh, I will ask you this, though, because I'm curious. Did you expect – Um, because you've, have you been on the show since the beginning? No, I haven't. I joined the show no. a couple seasons in. Okay. So um, when you knew you were joining the show, uh, mm -hmm. were you like, holy smokes, or were you like, yo, no problem, I'm going to get this? Like, I mean, I – I mean, I, I, have been, I have been a fan of the show. Like, I um, – I remember I was in uh, I was in South Africa on book tour, 
And while I was away, my wife had started watching it. And she was like, I'm going to stop watching this show because I think you're going to love it. And, and, she, and she's like, so come home and we're going to start watching this. And you don't understand how much sacrifice I'm making that I'm not watching this while you're gone. And so, and yeah, we just got really hooked on the show. So, and I will say that, um, of course, like, look, I didn't make it the number one show on television. It was already the number one show on television when I joined. I was very, very fortunate to be invited to join. But I wouldn't say I was like overly intimidated because I felt a real kinship with like sort of the kind of stuff I like to write and I feel like is in my wheelhouse as a writer with the show. Like while I was watching it, I was like, oh man, like I felt like this is a show that was very much speaking to the kind of things I love to write about, the kind of characters I love to write about, telling stories, especially with the way it plays with time in ways that I like. So when I got asked to join the show, I was kind of like, yeah, no, like I see, I mean, now, I hope that doesn't sound, I don't mean that in an arrogant way. Like I, I understood why they thought there would be a good fit because I, I felt it as a fan before I even joined it. So there was certainly a lot to learn and like a huge amount of like, you know, people to meet and, and like uh, the working style and the structure of the show that I had to get up to speed on and I knew nothing about before I joined it. But, but I probably had more confidence going into it than I should have. Uh, and you know, then you kind of get inside. You're like, okay, like now I'm realizing all the things I don't know. I was mostly just focusing on like tone and character and dialogue, not like how you make a, a big network show. So that was so I, I probably was less intimidated than I should have been until I joined it. That's cool. I mean, I, I it's interesting because and that that's good. We we had a question here about advice to emerging writers in Canada and emerging writers who want to work in the U.S. And I think this leads in like this leads into a good thing. I mean, all of us sort of want to break into TV at some point, or we take the job at some point we may have, or may not. So what, you know, let, let's talk about that. Like what would any of us give to an emerging writer or some of the things we did when we were emerging. And in some cases, like, I feel like I'm still emerging. Obviously I've only been in the room for two seasons of television and that's small compared to, you know, the, a lot of things that some other people are doing, but what, what are some of the obstacles? Let's talk about the obstacles that we've faced or had getting in um, or I, trying. I, I just, I want to jump in here about obstacles because I don't, there's tons of obstacles. We don't need to talk sure. about the obstacles. There's always going to be obstacles. I always look at what is it that you want at the end. Um, and, for me personally, and this may be different for Alain or for you, Corey, or anybody out there, it's about writing, writing and directing something that accentuates my vision and voice so that when somebody wants to hire me or I'm going to get a feature that I'm going to write that's based on some other material, they're picking me like they picked Alain on This Is Us for the, for the quality of work I've done in the past. So that the fit is good, so that I'm not being, at, it's been really funny, actually, I've had, with Meditation Park, I, um, I signed with CAA, I have a manager in the U.S., and there were some calls I would get where people would go, can you come and rewrite this horror movie? And I'm like, what in any of my, bo I mean, yes, thank you for asking, that, thinking I could do that, but I'm really not, that's not where I'm comfortable I would feel I would have many sleepless nights doing that. So for me, like to say to emerging writers, write your voice, write it, finish it. You have to finish the idea. That's a lot of where I think we get stuck when we're starting is we kind of go, oh, I don't know which one to do. Just do something to get to the page 100 get or, or that spec pilot script that you want to do for television, um, because that is worth gold. Having you actually made a statement, uh, Sort of, sort of, um, you know, you put your stake down and said, "This is me. This is who I am." Um, I think that all the things that mean is saying are, are hugely important. I mean, there's so many obstacles. Everybody faces obstacles. Some of them are overt. <laughs> some of them are sort of more subtle or systemic. Um, yeah. And so, I, I always, my approach is always like to try not to be my own obstacle. Like the world is going to provide more than enough obstacles to make it an, an interesting challenge to get anything made. So I try to get out of my own way as much as possible and try to try to not be the obstacle because I don't I, like they'll come no matter what. Right. Uh, and I think just like you know, even if you are listening to this and you heard from our introductions, like we all do many things. I've also produced a number of movies. I'm a producer on the television show. Um, 
the more things you do, the more you understand about how the business works, the more tools you have in your yeah. And the more and there's a reality which is like some obstacles like you only ever have to deal with them once. Other ones are gonna keep coming back over and over again. But like the more things you do in terms of making things and the more things you make, the more mistakes you make as you make those things, like you're gonna be better equipped for the next thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean I'm not I mean like it would have been great if I got offered the job on, on This Is Us when I was like 25. I didn't, but I also had like a ton of experience working in like independent Canadian movies for like a long time where mm-hmm. it's like nothing that ever happens on the set of This Is Us ever phases me at all because I've made independent movies in Canada with no resources <laughs> whatsoever. What could possibly happen on this giant <laughs> show that's going to throw me up? It's, like, it's fine. And so it's like, I think like, like the idea of like working in Canada, I mean, like if you work in Canada for like several years, like you're going to face so many challenges to make anything, to make anything even watchable, let, let alone good. <laughs> like Hollywood, where they have so many reasons, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm unstable. I'm, I'm <laughs> we're, all no, like, my, we're all unstable. No, I'm, we're my, all my, unstable. My, my internet was unstable. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with all of that. Like, I find it, you know, I found that I had this ran into the same problem because as soon as I got signed after Black Hawk, you know, everyone started sending, I mean, just scripts started coming away, but it was the same thing. It was like a lot of horror or a lot of like, you know, it was for me, it was a lot of get out, meet something. Oh, like, right. It's just right away, I was, I was tacked with that. And, you know, I, I get into some good grims and things like that, but then there was times when I actually, and, you know, I, I tell people this a lot. There was times, a lot of times, or saying yes and then just backing away because I was going with my gut and being like, this isn't what I'm about or this isn't what I'm going to feel good doing. And in some cases, you know, eventually I just I just like to make stuff and I want a body of work I'm really proud of. I'm not getting any younger. So for me, it's not about like going after that job right away and getting it. It's about what's going to really fulfill um, my my soul and my heart, regardless of what what that is, and it leads you back to surprising things. But it's always good. So yeah, it's 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 been it's been interesting. You know, there's a lot of stuff I love down there. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, yeah, I was I wasn't really inspired by um, those genre things that were coming my way because they were they're also like we want an original twist on this thing and we want this because this whatever we want. And I'm like, well, the reason why you want that is because it was original and it was like an original voice and it was a, it was a, a take on something. And now you want me to recreate that take and you want me to somehow like, it's just, you know, that's, yeah, I, I find that a real, a real challenge, but, but you when know, you, yeah. But when you break in, they're trying to figure you out as well. You know, and, and I mean, in, um, it's very different in Canada versus LA. Um, I know one of the questions we had, um, was about like, you know, do you focus on one thing or do you try to become as broad as possible? And the answer is both. I think in Canada, you have no choice but to be as broad as possible. Working in, I've worked in every single genre in Canada. But when I broke in the US, it was off my script, the F word, which was like a character driven romantic comedy. And I remember having a very candid conversation with my agents. You know, they're like, we want to brand you as a person who writes character driven, character driven romantic comedy. Um, if you are like, tell us if that makes you uncomfortable. Like, we're not trying to force you into a box, but like, that's what people down here are knowing you for, and so they want to know what your brand is. And I mean, it's like, um, you know, I don't mean to get into the marketing speak, but to me, like, what the brand means is like, what are you really, really good at at a certain price point, right? Like, they have their little list of how much, like, so like you know, like. Okay, so here's the person who's really, really good at that. At the price, right. right? And then, like, where are you, right, on the price list? And because they, what they want is the people, the person who's, like, the best at X. And if you are the best at X at the level they're willing to pay, then you're their choice, right? And as you develop, uh, you know, and you deliver and you're able to get more more achievement, like, you, like number one, you're going up that price list, hopefully. Um, then you also, like, build up the kind of, you build up the cred to sort of spread out. You know, to try other things, and people are willing to give you a chance because success oh, gives you sort of like breath. It's different here. Yeah. Here, like failure gives you breath. Like you're throwing out like a ton of stuff, right? And maybe like if you're lucky, like one of them like like snaps, and you're able to kind of keep focus in that way. Whereas there, it's almost the other way around. Um, and so you do when you're breaking in, and you guys have both had this experience, and I have too. Like you basically, when you get in, you're like on the island of broken toys, and they're just sending you all the <laughs> scripts that are like there's just scripts. That 
aren't working. Right? Yeah. They're right. like, hey, they're bringing you this like toy, and they're like, could you get this to work? You know, like we. It reminds us of something else that works, and it's okay. Like you can learn a lot doing that, but I mean, most of them don't work for a reason. And so you can, I mean, hopefully they're paying you and you can make a little coin doing that and, and, and like kind of learn the, the system. But, it, it, but most of those projects, but it's like, it is time because most of those projects like will never go anywhere. Um, and, 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 you know, then you have to sort of decide like, am I a broken toy mechanic or am I something else? Like, am I a person that's going to do my original things or it's going to kind of like hold myself to a higher standard? And it's okay. Like, like, and, and so they're trying to go, oh, okay, you're not a broken toy mechanic. Fine. Okay, now we understand. So you're the, you're going to go off into your shop, and you're going to make us an invention and bring it to us, and we'll decide if we like it. That's fine. Now we know who you are. Yeah, that's interesting about the the invention thing because I, I always find that question about this. You know, this is what people want. They want something like this. Do you have one of this, or do you have something like this? And I always find that well, they they don't really know what they want until they see what they want, or they you know if something something works. So I always. There's always that. There's always that moment where you've got this stack of stuff you're trying to you're trying to shop or show, and they might not get it. They might go, "Oh, this looks like a black mirror thing," and all of a sudden, there's something green lights. You know, two months later, of something that's kind of remotely close to what you might have, and you're like, "Yo, man, like, I just had a version of this." You know, like I just had a version of this, and you know, it's kind of like that might go because they trust the person more. Like you said, it's it's someone is they're gonna they're gonna let them go with their invention but they don't necessarily you haven't proven yourself yet you know i find that that's that, in a way i like that challenge like i i sort of you know if and if any, i do have anything that is remotely close to something that might be coming out then i'm like great let's i'm gonna just flip this and change it and see what else i can get because it's always really about the themes as opposed to the concept so for me so yeah but it, it's fascinating um, someone, someone asked, uh, I guess this is a similar question. They, uh, they said, what are the biggest lessons you learned when you started writing that every writer should know? I'm letting someone answer that. <laughs> I mean, I do think it is very much about finding your voice. Mina touched on this earlier. It's about finding your voice as a writer. And that, that doesn't necessarily come right away. It's okay if it doesn't come right away. Um, there is a distinction between like like anybody who gets excited about wanting to make this their life, their profession. Like you obviously really love it, right? I assume, uh, and so you know what really amazing work feels like. And inevitably, when you start, the stuff you're making doesn't feel as good as the stuff you love. And one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that all the filmmakers or writers or direct like all the people that you admire also went through this as well. You just didn't see their crappy early. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I remember saying to one of my film professors, like, you know, in film school, the only bad movies you ever see are the ones made by you and your classmates. You only watch masterpieces in film school. And then there's the crap you and your friends are making. And it just feels the gap feels so wide. But finding your voice takes time and you just have to do work. And I think that the thing about finding your voice is it's the most creatively satisfying thing when you kind of really lock into it. But it also... Mm -hmm professionally the smartest thing you can do because your voice is also like what makes you valuable. If you sound like anybody mm -hmm. else, what do they need you for? They're coming to you because of the specificity of the voice, because of the kind of like what's blazingly special and unique about your voice. That's what actually makes it worth it. Yeah, I find that's really, I find that's really interesting. That happens, that goes back to when they, people first try to brand you. I find too is that, you know, I heard a lot of you are of the Canadian this. Right. Or the Canadian this, which is like, well, that's hey, that's impossible. The guy's, you know, twenty years younger than me, and has a totally different experience of me than Oakland and than someone from you know Truro, Nova Scotia. That's a, you know the only thing that really connects us is one uh, the obvious thing. But yeah, I find that that's that can be confusing. I, I think sometimes it can, and I find that really, um, even even at this state of a career, like you know, having a span of twenty years, it can still potentially throw you off for a minute. I, I think and that's the thing is that, you know, I find that I, I got thrown off for a little bit trying to sort of fill that hole that was expected mm. of me. And it was, it was fine to experiment with, but it also, you know, it also, and I, I don't regret the time it took away, but it also showed me what I didn't want to do as well, which I, I think was, 
pretty important. But in that period of time, I wrote a lot of garbage. I've written a lot of garbage scripts. Like, I, I think like I, I've had all, I've gotten jobs where um, where someone would be, you know, you'd get hired by a producer to be like, I want you to write this thing that's a version of this thing that I like or this story that I like and I want you to write it. And be, I can't really write it what they want because I don't have their experience. So I can only approach it in a different way and you come back and they're just like, what, what is this garbage? Like, what is going on? You know, I eventually think it's really good. But, you know, I, I walk away for months feeling like I'm a terrible writer. I'm horrible at my job. I'm like, why am I even here? You know, and oh, eventually oh, like, think, yeah. Corey, I think that's, everybody goes, Alan, I'm sure you go through that, <laughs> right? There are days where it's like, no, you never go through that. You're amazing. I want what he's drinking. <laughs> I mean, I think. So, me, me. Oh, sorry. Well, I, one of the things I wanted to address was this, this idea of trends. Like, suddenly you're being asked to do Get Out, or they all want you to do the romantic comedy that was just a huge hit. I have always, um, I learned early that once they name a trend, like, for instance, it's vampire movies this week. We want vampire movies. Once they're asking for that, they're late. Like, if there's a vampire movie out in the marketplace, you don't want to be making a, a vampire movie unless you want to be making it five years from now. Because once you polish that script and you've, you've unbroken the toy, it's just not going to get made because there's just, the market is, you're going to hear the market is saturated with vampire movies. I mean, in television, I hear a lot. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, a they're, they're one-offs. They're uh, closed, I don't know what the term is, but they're closed episodes where it's like Law and Order, where they solve the mystery. And then there's the other type of show where it's um, like Six Feet, well, Six Feet Under is sort of one-offs, but um, where it's sequential, where you're learning about the characters, it's building. And serialized, yeah. And every time I take a meeting with an executive in broadcasting, it's one or the other, and it's never that one that they've picked. So you just have to write what feels honest, because if they could figure it out, they would do it themselves, right? You're the, as the writer, as the creator, you're the conduit with which they're looking, that you're presenting the world to other people. So it's through that magic, that, that soul that you have, that that's going to crystallize. By, by being um, pulled and pushed by trends, it's going to, unless you're interpreting that trend because you love it, I don't really see, I, I feel like you can waste a lot of time. And so early on, I just decided to just do the thing. And, and I mean, I think it's um, uh, Denis Villeneuve who said, I waited for Hollywood to call me. Because there is a little bit of that. Like, you want to be wanted when they want you. You don't want to be going, hi, hello. Um, at the same time, I have done every single meet and greet that I can think of down there. And it's worthwhile taking those meetings. It's worthwhile um, showing up and practicing. That's another toolkit thing. It's like, how do you walk into a meeting and you've never met the person before? And you try to form a bond in half an hour so they'll remember you, right? Um, it's a, it's, I always find all of it practice is a, is a practice. And then what eventually uh, it'll add up to something. And it, it's often unlikely. You don't, you don't even know what's going to happen. And then there you are. You've been offered a movie and um, away you go. I think that's really the idea. Of I've made it. I've, oh, sorry. oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say the idea of, of practice in those situations is really, really important because it can feel futile at the moment. Uh, but like I've done hundreds, probably over a thousand demo um, and most of them go nowhere. But the ones that su surprise you by going somewhere and you kind of never know, those can yeah. become, lead to huge career defining opportunities. And that's sort of the weird crapshoot, the, the weird kind of dice roll of Hollywood, it's it's as big a casino as Vegas in its own way. Um, but you do right. by doing these things, you get experience. It's even the even the putting yourself up to be the person who's going to fix the broken toy script. I mean, you can learn, you can waste a lot of time, but you can also learn a lot about how to fix something that's broken that you can take to your own work. Right. Um, 
and just like all right. those meeting greets that you do, the what they call what they used to call the uh, the you know water bottle and couch water tour. ball tour, water <laughs> bottle <laughs> tour on Zoom. Now. <laughs> but um, it, uh, um, you know, doing that allowing you to kind of like figure out how to talk about who you are um, to kind of like connect with people, figure out what it is that you can connect with them about. Um, because ideally, you're always trying to find some share, like something you would love, something that inspires. Mm -hmm. Even in this sort of, even in the sort of artificial situation of like a meet and greet, it's always better to meet somebody in those ways than to meet them for the first time when you're pitching them, you know. Um, and I think all of it is really good practice, but that is the problem, the challenge with this business. It's like when you're starting. I get, I, I assume like when you go to law school, I didn't go to law school, but I assume like you don't spend like like five years doing like pretend cases. And then maybe you get a real case. Like you're just like you know you have to like practice the law like right away. Um, and so right. uh, you know it, it, it's a weird industry where you can spend a lot of time just talking about what you want to do as opposed to doing it. So it is so important to also carve out the time to do the thing, to write, to make things, to put them out in the world. Um, all of us are here because. In addition to kind of like playing that game, we also just made things and put them out in the world. And as Mina said, like um, echoing what Denise said, like if you make something, you put it out there, and it's good enough, they call you. It, it's a good point. What, what you're saying too, going back to me, what you're saying about all those meetings and what you said, Elon, about that. I mean, one of the things like I I tended to pitch pretty good, and then I found a lot of the times I pitched bad. And what would be considered a bad pitch for me was me kind of not being interested in, in, you know, I'd go in and the meeting would become something else. And those actually, surprisingly, all of those meetings, most of those people, there's about five I can think of, who I'm still very good friends with now. Like, we have a relationship now where it's like, I've, I've actually just, all I've done is just been like talking to my friends and been like, hey, you should meet this person. And I've actually ended up hooking them up. But it, there are also, two of them are people that I will share my scripts with. And I'm not intending on showing them anything, but I just trust their eyes and they'll right. in turn show me some things to be like, this is what we're working on now. What do you think? And in that sense, that gives me so much, uh, so much valuable experience too, because I've got these pitch decks or I've got this like new one pager of this thing they're looking at right now. And all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm computing what he thinks about it or she thinks about it. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a really neat place to be in, in a, in a trusting place. And that's another advantage of, you know, getting in those rooms and getting in those spaces and having those relationships as you're privy to that information. But they also trust, you know, that you're trusted with that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to, you know, you're going to do your thing. It just means that, you know, but you also know that you, the door is open for you as well, which is, which is pretty, pretty cool to find. It's nice to have that relationship. It sometimes can make your age mad when you'd be like, yo, set me up on a lunch. This is just a hangout though. They're like, no, we don't want you to go hang out. It's like, well, eventually we're going to work together. We just don't know on, on what yet. So we just want to catch up. So, you know. I feel like, it, like you, you imagine like a giant office building and like every door is locked. And so you have like an amount of time and they're just like, you just, they give you like a big ring of keys and you're just trying to unlock as many doors as possible. You're not necessarily <coughs> through that door right now, but you want as many doors to as possible. So for when you do have something to sell, as many of those doors are open for you as possible. You know, um, and so you're not waiting for the time uh, you need to get through that door. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Maybe in this <laughs> building is on fire and there's wolves <laughs> loose in the building. <laughs> and so it starts because I want to add a little stakes to the situation. So the top of the building's on fire. <laughs> yeah, it's coming up from the from the ground floor, and you're somewhere in the middle. Just you know. So. so so, Mina, what's your, what's your sort of, like, I mean, I, I'm going to, without, you know, obviously tell us what exactly is working on, but what's your, what's your, like, grand dream project? Do you have another dream project or another thing that you were, if you could sit back and be like, if I had all the money or spend time in the world, and they just be able to do this one thing, do you have, what is that? Do you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't, so. Oh, I, um. Well, I really want to work with bigger budgets, the budgets I deserve to have after having so much experience. Um, having sat across the table at film festivals with the Christopher Nolans and, you know, I, I, I can't even tell you how many awesome male directors <laughs> I've gotten to sit across during my career. And I've gone, hmm, 
when, when is it my shot? And so I'm writing stuff that's bigger. I've got a period piece from the 80s that I'm doing that's based on a true story. Um, that's married with my politics, I guess. Or I, I don't even think it's political. I think it's so, social political, where I, I'm just trying to get different voices, um, different points of view and perspectives um, out into the mainstream as if they were the superheroes. Uh, so... I don't really think about, like, well, I'd love to do a musical. I'm writing one of those, you know. There's, but it's it's really about um, when do I get the time to shoot for 40 days? When do I, or 40, 50 days? When do I get the, all the toys I want uh, to, to make that awesome shot? Um, and that's partly getting cast. So that certainly helps having an agency now that's behind me. Um, I wanted to say, you know, you're... You're uh, opening the, the door. The building is on fire, and you got to get all the doors open. I actually started thinking of my meet and greets. I would go into the meet and greet and go, "This is a new person I'm meeting. This person and I. This person is something that's a gift, and I'm going to give them my gift. And and then I do a whole day of them, and I'd go, "That was my Oscar campaign. That was my Oscar campaign, where I don't even have a movie yet." But it's pre-production for because when when I do get nominated or I'm trying to get nominated, those people will all remember me. So it's like it's a simple it's it's as simple as walking into a room with an intention in terms of and I think it's that way when I go to parties at the Canadian Film Festival. You know, it's it's I just want to meet people. I'm so happy we're all making art and not war. Like that's one of the things. Like to just even sit here with you. Um, but so I don't specifically have like the dream project. Um, I've been very lucky to be able to realize uh, the stories I have so far. So I just want to keep building on that. I feel like it's too, too prong what I do. It's like I, I write stories from a certain perspective that are untold, but also me sitting in a chair directing tells a story. Um, and so it's, I, I'm trying to like do both um, in different ways. So that's, that's interesting. Like, I, I mean, do you, when you're writing, are you writing, are you writing, are you, you, I guess you, you just said that, but are you thinking of how you were going to shoot something? Like someone wrote a question here about, you know, talking about a cameo or location or permission or considering budgets when you're writing a spec. Are you thinking about how you were going to direct that? Or are you just writing the actual story first and then putting your, or are you going both as if, you know, I'm directing this tomorrow and this is what I, or this is exactly what I want it to be, or can I do this? Are you thinking of what any limitations is or any permissions? Are you just going with, I'm, I'm putting it all in the paper? I'm putting it all in the paper. Yeah, like for instance, if I want to start um, with archival footage from NBC on a period piece to set the tone, I'm just going to assume I'm going to get it. Um, I've also read scripts where uh, the writer has, a, has a, a voice that says, if we have the budget for this song, this is the song, the Bruce Springsteen song is the song I want, right? So, and that works in a comedy, but that kind of breaking the wall would not really work in a sort of serious drama, let's say, right? Um, I, but I do think the way I'm directing it is part of the way, that's the, that's the unique voice in it. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't hold back, and I do think pie in the sky. I, I, I don't think about budget. It's two different hats, right? When you're, when you're writing, you write like, the world is your oyster, and then you, you get, you, you know, you find out your budget, and you've only got one day to shoot that entire sequence, um, and you start modifying. But don't, I don't limit myself when I start. Other people have tried to limit me. I'm not going to be the person who's going to limit me at this point. Yeah, exactly what Mina said. I mean, there's no reason to yeah, that's cool. back in script. Just write the perfect version of it. Because, yeah. you, uh, because like, let me let you in a little secret. You're not going to shoot the purple version of it. Yeah. Uh, and it. so no, nobody is going to uh, reject your script because of something like that. If you're lucky enough to get to the place where you're actually making it and you have that, you'll sit down with your line producer and your producers and, and, and you'll figure out what you can actually afford. Um, and that, but that's like, that's like when everybody's already committed to making it. I think that's what so many, so many, I think, newer or emerging writers are afraid of is that sometimes they'll get they'll get some some mentorship or some guidance where they'll say there's no way you can do this or 
the first thing they're going to look at is, oh, you've got a helicopter scene in here. That's not going to happen. Can you write it a different way? And I think that that I think that that leads to a bit of confusion to some writers of you know getting their voice out there or getting the thing that can be made out there, which I think is is pretty tricky, especially up here. Um, well, well, that's what I always hear from people anyway. I've never really written for a budget. That? Corey, when I hear you say a producer's going to say there's a helicopter shot in this and you can't afford it, I'm wondering as a writer, what is the real note? What's wrong yeah. with the story? What's wrong with the story? Yeah. Why are you yeah. picking on the shot at this point, right? Yeah. yeah. I will also say, let me say two things. Number one, any producer worth their salt wants to raise as much money as possible to make yeah. this movie because they get paid a percentage of the budget of the film. So, yeah. so like, if, you, if I mean, I've written scripts where we ended up making it for much more money than we thought we were. And guess what? Everybody gets paid more. Uh, yeah. I, that's why you're that's why you're, you're paid a, a percentage of the overall budget um, with a flat fee. If, you know you can't go or the floor, or you can't go below that because the sky's the limit if you raise the money. I mean, I wrote I, you know I've written movies that have attracted gigantic movie stars, which suddenly tripled, quadrupled our budget. Mm-hmm. Um, so so don't worry about that helicopter shot. I mean, worry about what. What Mina's saying, if the helicopter shot is is like spectacle papering over structural or character problems, fine. Um, but yeah, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that kind of stuff. And the other thing you have to remember is when you're starting out, your script has two functions. One, look, of course you want to get it made. Obviously you want to get it made. But you also want people to read your work and be excited. Okay? You want people, I mean, nobody gets excited when they read a book, read a, a screenplay and they go, you know, I was reading the screenplay and it seems very, very producible. That's not what they're excited about, right? Uh, what they're excited about is if it blows the doors off creatively. Uh, if it's doing something, if it's like exciting, if there's a vibrant voice, if it's doing interesting things structurally, if the character is riveting and they're like, this is like a movie star part. If the ending is so surprising and yet inevitable and leaves them feeling like, like the satisfaction of a great story well told, that's going to get you another meeting. That's going to get you a job offer, even if that movie never gets made. And of course you hope it will. So, I mean, like, don't limit yourself. I mean, it's like I read these scripts that people send me, and I'm like, let me tell you what limits you. Spelling mistakes on page one. Okay? Just proofread your script. Make sure that there's not a single mistake in that script. And I don't care if half of it takes place on the moon. If it's, if, if, but if you spell the moon wrong, I'm going to feel like you're an amateur. I, I also think um, for hyphens, writer-directors, the the mistake many emerging writers start with as a director is they write all the shots in. They write in so much detail. Uh, when I'm writing, I am literally writing for the reader. Yeah. I'm writing to tell the story as if I was going to sit down with you, Corey and Alan, and go, here's the movie that I'm going to write. Here's some sample dialogue. But I try to keep it, um, I try to keep it tight. Like there's actually one thing I learned, um, uh, from another writer was to really think about the architecture of the page when you're writing. That there should be a lot of white space. That that mm-hmm. after pay, uh, that you if you're going to tell a joke, you put the the lead line at the bottom of the page. You put the punchline on the second page. So you're rewarding the reader for having turned the page. Because they they said to me, you know, those executives who are reading your script in Hollywood, they're reading it in their bathrobe on Saturday. Their kid is over there watching cartoons. If they put down your script, they're not picking it up again. So you have to keep them, tur- keep turning, keep turning the page. And that's, that's like, I don't, I used to do lots of shots. I used to go, oh, and cut there, and, and here's the drone shot. And it's like, no, I don't even do that now. It's all about, I'm writing like a writer would write, not thinking someone else would direct it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, I, I find, like, this is one thing I think I got into a bit of de- a debate with maybe a writing teacher on this at one point where, um, about formatting. Like, you know, you understand how to format a script. Everyone understands how to format a script. But, you know, I don't necessarily slug my script the same way as, you know, things are, are shootable scripts. Like, I'll slug my script in bold. I'll, I'll keep bold. And sometimes I'll just be, like, in the kitchen or this. or And, and I... I I will sometimes write the script as a story um, with a story with slugs and it won't necessarily be exterior. It might just say outside the, outside the station or something. And it was really funny um, having this debate with a person about this because they were like, that shows that you are unprofessional, but it's like, but, um, but I'm like, you know, I've also been in a room where we've, 
you know, we've structured TV shows differently or, you know, everyone has their way of writing. And if you, it doesn't mean you necessarily don't know what you're doing, but it makes for an exciting read. But also I feel that it's great because I wrote Black Cop the same way. Like I feel that that shows people exactly what it's going to look like, exactly what it's going to feel like when I shoot it. And it's, it's my voice. Like that's how I, that's how I write. And that's what they get. And it would be nothing for me to just, you know, slug it normally and be like dash, slug, dash, boom, mm. day. No, no problem. Mm. But as that first time read, give them some, this is what I give them. This is what they get. And I'm not mm. really worried about that. Like I'm not worried about, you know, I am worried about the spelling though. I am worried about the grammar. mark. Like, I love know, spell check. Spell check is not friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even that, even that fails you sometimes. Yeah, true. true. No, I mean, I mean, look, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to like be pedantic. But I mean, to me, it's like uh, like the like the grammatical or spelling error is like seeing the boob in the shop. It's just right. like you know, it's, it's like seeing uh, one of the cat, one of the crew members reflected in a window. It's just yeah. like it's just part of making something competently. You don't you don't do that. Um, but there's, I, I, I mean, I think this like proper formatting is when you've read enough scripts, it becomes invisible. Just like the language of film, like right. if you're actually watching a movie, like wait a minute, how did we teleport from that angle to that angle? You know, mm -hmm. why does it look wrong when you, you know, when you, when you cross the axis and things like that? Um, in a way that you maybe don't even register, it just kind of like takes you out for a moment. Mm -hmm. and proper formatting can be helpful that way, but it's not the end all be all. And if you have a good, I mean, and I do think I agree with both of you, the read is the most important thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Making sure that it's as an immersive an experience as possible, because if the story is well told, it doesn't matter um, if your you know use of int or x is perfect. Uh, you can fix that later. I mean, I do think it's good to know how it all works, so you're making a deliberate choice. Like, there's a difference between choosing to break the rules and not knowing the rules. And right. the is is a certain matter. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, what uh, what's what's the Here's some fun. What is the, what's the scariest thing you've ever written? Um, you mean in terms of tone or in terms of challenge? In terms of tone, I was hot in a horror movie once, but uh, and it was very disturbing. But uh, no, <laughs> the challenge for me actually it was writing my uh, first novel um, because I'd been working as a screenwriter for a very long time and felt very comfortable in the form. Uh, I had a story that I wanted to tell, and I tried to crack it as a movie for years, and I just it just didn't make sense as a movie. And then one day I thought to myself, like, mm. well, if I could just, it's not, I don't have anything against voiceover, but I was like, if I could just, yeah, I could tell a movie from a first person perspective, like voiceover. And then I realized, like, I was like, if I tell an entire story from voiceover, that's just a novel. And I started, but I was like, let me try it out. <laughs> and and it was once I realized that what I was writing wasn't a uh, voiceover, it was a novel, and that I was going to do a first person kind of like memoir, fictional memoir, uh, to tell the story. Like so many things that had befuddled me and eluded me in trying to crack the story suddenly fell into place so effortlessly. But at the same time, I'd never written a book before. I was a screenwriter, not a novelist. So it was intimidating. And also, like, let's be clear, no one was asking for a novel from me, right? It wasn't like people were like, the publishing world was banging on my door being like, you know, we know you've worked in screenwriting for a long time, but uh, have you ever thought about writing a novel? Um, so I knew that it was going to take a long time, and it wasn't going to be something anybody, like my agents weren't going to be like, oh, how exciting, you wrote a novel. Um, <laughs> now, in the end, my agents loved the book, and we sold the rights, and it actually, and, and because unlike a screenplay where you don't control the underlying material, I created the IP. So, you know, as we're developing it as a TV series, like I control the underlying material. It, like ultimately it's my decision what happens with it. Um, and, but, but it was intimidating because I was challenging myself. I was also, I've been writing a lot of like comedy and drama, but very grounded character and stuff. Suddenly I was writing science fiction. Again, very off brand. It was a relationship story wrapped inside a science fiction story. Um, but I just, but you know, for me, it was like I had a story to tell, and I felt like I equipped myself as as a writer, so I had the tools to do it. And I just, there is something to be said, especially the further you get in your career. And I know this is less relevant for emerging writers than it is for those who've been doing it for a while. To kind of keep challenging yourself with things that are straight up like a money decision that aren't a professional decision to write something for the love of the game because it's really easy when you turn the thing you love into your job for the thing you love to become eroded by all the professional 
necessities. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love just writing something that has no dollar value to it that I just need to write. Sometimes you get surprised. My, my book did very well for me. Uh, it was a huge boon to my career, <coughs> but I didn't write it thinking that would be the case, just the opposite. It's probably why, it, I mean, it's a great novel, but also it's probably why it became a great novel. You were writing it. I always think about intention. Mm -hmm. Like when, when you're writing, why are you doing it? And it's, for me, it's never the money. It's often, often the challenge. Um, so, to, so, you know, to jump in with like, what's the scariest thing I ever wrote? It's always the blank page, the next script is really friggin' scary. And I, I'm in, I'm in the middle of that right now. I'm in the middle of a new movie that, uh, I'm not sure I love the character. Like, I actually think I might have started with, I might have to do some open heart surgery, and I'm just, I'm, when I get back to Vancouver, I'm going to try this other tactic with the character. Um, but I also just finished a five-minute short for um, a collaborative project on COVID uh, that Ingrid Benninger put together. And I decided, it was, a, it was uh, nine women in isolation all over the world, filmmakers, who were just going to tell their snapshot of what whatever they wanted to do, and we we're going to piece it together as a feature, uh, as a global um, time capsule from a female perspective. And I decided to make um, a fiction film, completely narrative, but with nobody in it, hmm. so that the so that the audience is putting the lead characters into the shots, right? So Greg Middleton from um, Watchmen and Game of Thrones and I, we're stuck in isolation. We're really good friends. He goes and shot, shoots a scene with me. We cut it together. And because it's so tricky making a movie with no one in it, we got it wrong. We had to reshoot it. <laughs> and that was really scary. At one, at, at, at one point, I was like, I'm just going to bail. I'm just going to, if it doesn't work, I'm just, and it turned out to be one of the most rewarding things. I think it shows my skill as a, as a storyteller because there is no one in it and everybody it's, it's very moving. It's poetic, but it's like, I did the trick of making people put the characters in the story themselves. So when I show a shot of a path and it's empty and I say, our hero walks down the path, people are seeing her. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was, and, and that has nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with my narrative period piece that's going to be a super big budget with movie stars, but maybe it does. Like, maybe it does have, nothing's ever wasted in what you do. But that certainly was not for the money. It wasn't for the glory. It was to, to see if I could do it. And, boy, I, f I feel really good owning that. Like, that's, I don't even care if people see it. <laughs> like, I just know. I just know I did it, right? So, that's scariest, but great. That idea is so important too, because sometimes you're like you follow your creative instincts towards something, and you and you're like it, it can feel at moments like am I wasting my time because it's not what I'm here for. But I feel like it's like I forget the term, but like when a you know like when a butcher uses every piece of an animal, you know, like right. I feel like for example, I felt I had this feeling, and I, I couldn't put my my finger on it, where I was like I was trying to do too much in my feature scripts. My feature scripts were getting more and more dense; they were getting longer. Mm. And, and I realized what it was, was that I was drawn to a certain novelistic storytelling, which certainly you can do in television, but in television, you don't, you never know if you're going to be able to finish your story or not, right? Right. Uh, you, you know you might be able to start your story, but I, I was drawn to a certain novelistic kind of like um, uh, density in the storytelling that was not suited to feature screenwriting. Right. And when I wrote the book, I didn't set out doing it this way, but I was like, oh, this is the form for that. And actually, right. my screenwriting got way, not simpler in a bad way, it just got my screen, my, I, I suddenly was like, okay, this is a feature story. And my screenwriting got a lot airier and, and a lot less dense and a lot simpler and a lot more focused and propulsive because it was more focused. And I realized I had been kind of like creatively, like kind of reaching for something that I didn't even, it wasn't until I wrote a novel, which by the way, like took a long time. It isn't necessarily like the best like decision in terms of like career development. But I, I, I once I got to the end, it was like, oh, this is what I was yearning for and was right. to cram into the wrong uh, container. And actually it made the screenwriting better. Yeah, I actually, that's funny because uh, I realized sometimes, because I do installation work, I've done uh, video art, uh, and so you have to pick the form yeah. in which that idea is going to express itself and realize itself in the best possible way. So that it's true, my, my, my screenwriting is a little less um, toying in the poetic because I got to do 
the poetry in this short mm -hmm. or in the installation I got to have you sit in real time for a durational <laughs> moment as opposed to trying to get you to do that while reading my script you know what was scary for you Morgan? oh gosh I wasn't even thinking about myself in that um, I'm scared of everything I'm scared of everything you know I, I, I'm actually like I'm one of those people that are afraid to actually show a script so I, it's the same right. thing for me. It's like the blank thing on the page. I, I think I was scared even when I wrote my last one because I was like, I knew what was going out there. I knew what I was going to say. And I knew I was actually going to lose a lot of, you know, fans from my other work because of the work that I was, you know, I was basically showing myself through this. And I was like, I have to be able to not be precious and, and know that I'm not actually as much as, you know, we show our work, we present our work and, you know, in some ways, it's not in like we hang our work in a gallery. It's just that I'm going to lose a certain amount of of, of people that have either thought they liked what I did or, you know, had supported what I'd done. I knew I was going to lose a lot of them because of that. Um, just because of the nature, and I'm saying because of the nature of, say, some of the fan base that's on a show like Trailer Park Boys and, and the, you know, we get a very, um, I'll say, a, a very in some ways close-minded and, and volatile group of people who um, have very heavy opinions on the type of thing that I'm things I work on and I knew that I, that I was going to lose that and you know I certainly don't think any of the fans or people are, are bad people but because I still want to entertain them or want to share something with them but I was just like I had to let that go and you know and 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 you fear that you know it's not going to be taken in any way um, you know, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. I guess that's that's sort of always the way it works with me. I, I was going back to you on, on something you were saying earlier. I, I had a question for both of you. Um, thinking about this is like when you were talking about, you know, keeping the integrity of work and going with your instinct, do you ever find that notes can – have you ever experienced that notes – or, or have you ever faced the idea or had to come up against or make a decision about notes that you've received that could have actually thrown you off your original purpose? Um, and what's the, what, where do you define or when do you differentiate the idea of notes being um, productive for you or detrimental to the work that you eventually will finish? Well, often, I'm, if I give a script out to you, for instance, to both of you, I am not looking for you to tell me how brilliant I am. I'm actually, I've got questions. I've got questions that I'm, I want, I want I, I've got questions for you about whether it's making sense, do you like the characters, is the, what's the theme that you get out of it? So, so, um, it's, I never throw a script out going, I don't know. I always kind of know that it's, it, and the first draft is never perfect. That's the thing, the, the preciousness of that script. What you're looking for, and I mean, I've all heard this, is, is um, uh, you, want to, you want to get the common thread of the note. You want to get the note behind the note. Uh, you, you don't want to, you, and sometimes, but it, it's also, there's no, there's no um, formula for it. Sometimes it's that uh, odd note that you get that leads you to the place you need to go. So it's really about understanding what, where, you, where you think you lack at that point when you're getting notes. I mean, I don't know if any writer's ever given out a script going, this is perfect. You're a secure person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are. yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, for me, because of the quality of my work, <coughs> I get notes. Oh, no, I'm joking. Um, the, uh, the, I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> the, you know, the, definitely to what Mean is saying, you're seeing if there's a common thread, like you're getting this, like, because there's, you have to take the difference between, like, taste and interpretation. You can't argue with taste. You can argue yeah. with interpretation. I take that to everything in my life. You know, if somebody loves a movie that I hate, we, I'm not going to change their mind, but we can argue about what it means. Um, but with notes, you're, so you're trying to say, like, well, this is just this person's taste. You know, they don't like this. They don't like that. Um, but when you're talking about interpretation, then you can kind of like get into like, well, what do they think this means? What are they not getting? That they thought, mm -hmm. like every, you know, there's a quote and I forget who it's from, but it's like every, every, you know, feedback is always, every criticism is like a tragic expression of an unmet need. So what are, what are they want that they're not getting in this moment? And if I can use the note to get to that, then I can decide, 
is the thing that they want that they're not getting something that I was trying to give them and so I failed to give it to them? Or right. am I trying to withhold it? And what they are expressing is that they wanted it and I didn't give it to them. Those are both right. valid. I'm trying to figure out which one it is, right? right. If, like if I'm, you know, if like I have a child and I'm attempting to like teach them a lesson, I might do it by telling them a lesson or I might do it by withholding some information. Like what, what am I trying to, what, you know, what am I trying to give them? And so because of that, I, I'm always kind of looking at exactly what Mina said, the note behind the note. One of the things, you know, it's like, it's like you're, you're it's like you're in surgery and you know, you're both the doctor and the patient, right? But someone's telling you, know, someone's telling you, like, I feel a pain in my knee. And your job is to figure out, well, is it the knee or is it, is it the hamstring? <laughs> That's awesome. Is it in your brain? Like, you're trying to figure out what the, what the problem is. Often, an, a, 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 like, if somebody says the third act isn't satisfied, it's not the third act's the problem. It's actually you didn't set it up properly in the first act or you didn't complicate right. it in, a, right. in the right way. The second act. So you're just it, so I, I listen to all notes because I'd rather get a Good. note in screenplay than like when we're testing the movie when it was released because it's a lot harder to change it that. That's just, right. Yeah, please, right. One second. Here's a note right now. Mina's yeah. got to leave to catch her ferry. You got to get out of here because we are just you were starting <laughs> to get a little close in your time. So um, we yeah. uh, Elon and I will stay on for two seconds and we'll let you go and say all goodbye right. and then we'll say everybody thanks, thanks, so thanks much. for hanging out. It's always nice to talk we'll to talk you soon. and yeah, you're just so great and yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, see you too yeah. as well. Yeah, take care. Okay. Awesome. Well, that was awesome. I love Mina. Um, did you know each other before? Uh, yes, uh, we know each other from Vancouver. We're both from Vancouver. Um, yeah. And so the Vancouver filmmaking community is a pretty tight knit group. That's nice. So you you kind of meet everybody uh, eventually. The um, but you know it was interesting because she was talking about working with Greg Middleton. Now for those who don't, I mean Greg Middleton is like a, like a A level uh, DOP on like gigantic like on you know Game of Thrones and Watchmen and like you know he's a huge uh, director of photography. But like he also just came up through the Vancouver independent filmmaking community. And so, you know, right. you use contacts early on in your career and not everybody achieves greatness, um, even if they're incredible, but like it not, it's not necessarily a metric of talent, right? It might be just the, the projects that they, that they managed to get on and whether they pop at the right time, but you're all kind of coming up at the same time. It's like these relationships that you build early on in your career can prove when you, when none of you had any power or anything to offer each other, except just, you just got along and shared a love of this thing. Um, that those are the people who become your peers as you go through. That, I mean, one. I mean, it wasn't a strategic decision when I was coming up, but like, I definitely love to get to know uh, cinematographers, editors, production yeah. designers, uh, directors, not just other writers. Because yeah. I, I even with that, I mean, I love talking with other writers, but I was also like, you know, it's good to have like a broad group of like of like it's like a broad crew. Um, uh, so that when you're coming up and when you when you all sort of find your way through the industry, you're able to keep working together. As you kind of like work your way up, and that and these are the people that in an industry where you can't always trust everybody for various reasons, it's nice to have those deep relationships with people you can trust. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, um, for me on the side, Greg, Greg's work on the killing was. Oh yeah. Like, the killing, his work in the killing was like what? Um, awesome. Well, this has been uh, this has been really cool, man. Um, yeah. Thanks. I think they, they gave us an hour, so I, I think we're we're there. But you know, um, what's so you're you're on the show now? Is there anything? I guess you're developing. Oh, actually, one more thing. You're developing your book now. You're trying to develop the book into a series. Mm -hmm. um, how? I mean, actually, this is good. We keep you. I'm going to keep you for this for everyone. How hard do you? How difficult is that? Or how challenging is that? Um, developing that into a series is it coming easy for you, or is it? Um, are you discovering new things about the story as you do that? Um. I mean, it, easy in some ways, very, very hard in others. I mean, I chose to, wrote it, to write it as a novel for very specific structural and point of view reasons, and so, and which, which felt very much novelistic to me, not screaming, right? And so trying to figure out how to tell the story uh, in a way that was going to work uh, on screen it was like, you know, there's a lot of things that have to change. Like for me, it's like like form is function, right? So there's choices that I made in the storytelling, which were because it was a novel. 
So in a movie, in a, in a movie or a television show, like I just I'm going to make some different choices in terms of the storytelling because I don't think it's a one to one ratio. I think you have to find the equivalent. Um, at the same time, I I I'd adapted enough other people's work that I was like I made those choices pretty early on. I just made the call rather than I I was like I know that there's a, a version where you like muddle through it and like you know start peel like you're kind of like running the race and you start like peeling off pieces of your body as you go. And I was like, that's not the way to go. Um, you know, I was like, figure out what pieces you can take with you now, right? You don't want to be halfway up the mountain and realize you packed all the wrong stuff in your backpack. I love these metaphors. I don't know why. Um, and so uh, I like, uh, I, you know, I notice I've been using a lot of, uh, of their metaphors, but it's like pack the bag that you, with the stuff you need to get to the top of the mountain. So that for me, so I think I made some really strong choices early on. The other thing um, I I knew is that like the book was successful. I got to tell the story that way and people read it and it's out there and nothing I do with the TV show changes that. And so I just embrace that early on. Like it's going to be its own thing. It needs to be its own thing. Um, at the same time, like it's the same characters. It's the same theme. It's the story that I love so much that I spent years working on it as a novel. And I feel really privileged that I get the chance to tell it as a, as a TV show. So it's like fine, you know, so it's like both, like almost everything in this industry, it's both. Um, it's both. So, I mean, the flip side of it is like when the studio executives or the network executives ask me a question, I always have an answer. And they're like, wow, you really know this world so well. I'm like, well, you know, like I wrote a whole novel about it. Like it's <laughs> like most times when you're writing a television show, you don't write an entire novel before you do it. So, uh, yeah, so I, because I did it that way, like I have, there's a, there's a depth to my understanding of the world, of the characters, of the themes that I just wouldn't normally bring to a television. Right, right. Oh, man, that's awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry? No, no, no. I, was, I know. I was going to say, I mean, like, it is, you know, it, 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 it is the difference between, like, I was been fortunate working on This Is Us is really, like, when you have a movie, right, uh, and, you you know, you, you've worked on both, it's like, you're going to tell your story, right? And, like, you have, like, two hours or 90 minutes or whatever you have, and you're going to tell your story. And you're probably telling a story about, like, the most heightened moment in your character's life, right? Like, the worst thing that ever happened, mm -hmm. which ends up being the best thing that ever happened. Or whatever it is, right? Um, yeah. But on a TV show, it's different. Like you know, you're, you're you're picking it up and you're looking at all the facets of this character, all the facets of this premise, and it's it's just different. And so, because I'd had that experience on This Is Us, I was also able to come back to my book and be like, oh, like here's all these things that I can do that I didn't do in the novel and that I wouldn't have been able to do in a film. And I, and I felt like I was really um, like. Uh, I didn't take the job on this is us for this reason, but it really taught me how you like take, how you really like explore the facets of a character in a world and just keep kind of pushing and pushing and pushing to kind of make it more to keep finding more interesting things to say about these people. Awesome, that's great, man. Thank you so much for this. Um, it was a pleasure hanging out. I hope we get to connect again soon. Um, I, I love the. Uh, I loved your movie, by the way. I loved it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that, and, you know, this is awesome. Um, to anyone out there, thanks for joining. I just want to, you know, well, while we have everyone, well, me and Spada, while everyone's here, just before we go, um, we're all in different places, obviously. We're gathering in different places, but, you know, for everyone, wherever you are, uh, I would, on behalf of everyone, just want to acknowledge that we are having this gathering and this hangout on um, traditional and unceded territory of a vast array of our Indigenous and First Nations uh, in this country. And um, it's our pleasure and our honor to be doing it here today. So um, thanks a lot to the Canadian Film Festival. Thank you, Elon. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Karen, everyone. Nicholas, for keeping things going, Burn. And uh, yeah, rock on everyone. Write good stuff, make movies. And yeah, awesome. <laughs>